Welcome back to The Human Perspective. Um, today I have the privilege of introducing you to Victor Pineda, who is now Dr. Victor Pineda, who has his uh, PhD in urban planning. But when I had the privilege of meeting Victor 18 years ago, when I first started working at the World Bank in 2002, uh, Victor was someone that I uh, met because the president at the World Bank, um, Jim Wilkinson, was convening a series of meetings around the world where youth were being brought together. My job was to help ensure that disability was being integrated into the work of the bank. And so I spoke to Mr. Wilkinson about getting disabled people who would be a part of these meetings, and he agreed. So Victor was one of the first people that went to the meeting in Paris. So Victor, nice to see you again. Thank you, Judy, and you had to f fight pretty hard to get me into that meeting. I had to fight to get Victor in the meeting because you can see Victor uses a, a respirator. Yeah. And so um, we got a call from the bank office. It didn't come to me. It went to people I was working with. who what they, they told them, don't tell Judy. Um, but they said that they didn't want Victor to come because what if he got sick? And so I wrote to them and I said, well, I think they're in Paris, and if somebody gets sick, they've got hospitals, and Victor is going. And so that's how Victor got there with a group of other really great people. And that's how my life changed, <laughs> because I ended up realizing that there was a huge movement of young people, and there was a movement on defining what the future could look like, and I wanted to be part of those conversations by being in that room and building relationships with decision makers, I got very excited about what was possible. I mean, you're a change agent, right? You're not shy. You kind of have good ideas and you put them forward. So when you were at that meeting, there were, I think, four or five other disabled young people there. Um, what do you believe the impact of the group being at that meeting was? <laughs> Judy, every single person you brought together has done tremendous things. Ambrose ran for parliament in Uganda. Mohammed is, is getting his PhD. He was doing great, great work all over the world in Lebanon with DPI. And, I mean, all, a lot of us in that, those meetings have done incredible work. And that's just by giving, giving us a chance and making us believe in ourselves. Well, I think what was really important when I look at the work that you've done over the years. You've really been both a strong advocate in organizing with disabled people and moving forward and becoming an academic. And I know that's been somewhat of a struggle for you years ago. Yeah. Um, what do you think the importance of your uh, being both an advocate, working uh, domestically and internationally, as well as an academic? Uh, what are some of the unique things that you've learned that you're contributing? Well, I think in order to create meaningful change, I had to learn to accept my own privilege and power, but also accept and understand the conditions that created hardship and created, you know, marginalization or somehow felt, you know, discriminated against and try to reconcile both of those. So I am an immigrant. Came to this country when I was seven years old. Um, I remember telling my brothers I would never learn to speak English because it's such a difficult language and there's all the rules complicated with spelling and grammar. Um, I also, obviously, um, you know, my mother is from Serbia in Yugoslavia. My father's from Venezuela, so I had a very mixed uh, background in terms of growing up. But I realized ultimately that in order to be an advocate, you had to be able to speak up and speak truth to power. But in order to be an academic, you had to be sort of like cool, collected, and sort of objective in terms of your pursuit of truth. Sometimes I put on the advocacy hat, sometimes I put on the academic hat, and uh, they're all kind of part of my Swiss Army knife in order to, you know, eliminate barriers and move things forward. And I think, you know, you were the one that sort of pushed me by reminding me, you know, 
you need to be at the table and we need super well and ca very capable advocates, you know, with advanced degrees. And I think that was, that was, you know, I was the first, I was one of the first generation of folks to go through the ADA. I was 12 when the ADA was signed into law. So, you know, there's, there is for me a very clear, um, role for a multi-generational struggle. And my own contribution was, how do I take my work and my advocacy, whether that was grassroots, you know, in Berkeley as a student leader, um, later uh, my experience in negotiating and drafting and then implementing the UN Con Convention on the Rights of People with Disabilities, and then later thinking about how does that knowledge, you know, feed into a bigger body of work. <laughs> I was doing my PhD, there were no, I couldn't find publications on, in the field of urban planning that looked at the issue of accessibility, or looked at the issue of disability rights in the field of urban planning, very few. Um, and then later, as I developed my own sc scholarship, and I started writing, I realized that, that I just had a call the other day with the National Institute of Urban Affairs in India, and they have a national 100 accessible cities campaign, and they're using my research um, to sort of help shape the work that's going to shape 100 cities in India. So, Victor, um, what is your message to a younger disabled individual about thinking in relationship to their futures? I think asking questions and staying curious and asking the question, uh, how, what if, you know, what if this or that, what if I could attend this meeting or what if I could you know, get support to do this? It's really like, what is the art of the possible? I think it's really important for a young person. And then also having the chutzpah or, or the, the knowledge um, or the bravitas, kind of, like, kind of like put yourself out there specifically by realizing that as a younger person, you kind of have a kind of get away with anything kind of opportunity because people aren't set in their ways and they don't view you as a as any kind of major threat so you can call people up and say would you mind having an informational interview and people will probably say yes i mean i think there's i think there's there's a opportunity for you as a young person to reach out to people to find mentors to develop relationships that you have much more leeway to do earlier in your life than later. So I want to say that Victor is not a shy guy. Victor will go out and reach anyone that he thinks can help him um, advance the work that he's doing. And I've really respected that so much over the years. Some of your contributions, and we're coming to a close of the interview. Um, if you could just briefly talk about what you're doing at UC Berkeley as a lecturer and how your class is going. Yeah, so, um, I took a class called Disability uh, Community Development and uh, Community Development and Public Policy for Disability Rights, and I uh, ended up now teaching that class many years later and it's subscribed heavily subscribed over 80 students sign up every year um we've taken a course that incorporates public policy design innovation uh and sort of gives students a chance to sort of see the world differently and, and then reimagine reimagine it and, and part of that also is part of our global campaign so not only are they doing homework, but they're actually feeding 
into the Cities for All Global Initiative, which his mission is to incentivize and transform 100 cities to be more inclusive, accessible, and resilient. Okay. Last year, they developed 42 case studies where they looked at 42 different projects around the world that incorporate accessible and universal design principles, not just in a building, but an entire area of a city. So I want to thank you very much for spending time with us. And we're going to give you, um, at the end of the interview, some links so you can learn more about the work that Victor has been doing. But for me, it's been great that he's been able to combine his advocacy work as a disability rights leader, also in the academic field, and not just in the United States, but he speaks six languages. So obviously he did learn English plus, 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 and he's traveled to more than 70 countries. Unfortunately, we didn't get into talking about the filmmaking that he's been doing and many other amazing things. But I think the bottom line is Victor really learned early on that he had goals, um, maybe not completely defined, but he really wanted to be a part of changing the world. And I think you've been doing a great job in doing that. So thank you for sharing time with us. Thanks to you for making a lot of this possible, Judy. Thank you, Victor. Thank you, everybody. See you soon.